Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. A Canadian senator wants to put an end to forced and coerced sterilizations once and for all. And she hopes her private member's bill will do just that. APTN's Fraser Needham has that story. Nicole Rabbit and her mother were both victims of forced sterilizations. She told the Senate committee on Thursday what her late mother would have said were she here today. She would have said, someone has to be accountable for the act of genocide that we Indigenous people have faced and continue to face in regards to forced and coerced sterilization. We Indigenous people have always been poorly treated and we would like it to stop. Senator Yvonne Boyer says she hopes her private member's Bill S-250 does just that by making doctors who continue to perform coerced sterilizations liable for conviction under the criminal code. Boyer initially did not want to further re-traumatize Indigenous women by bringing them into the justice system, but changed her mind after listening to survivors like Rabbit. And they were testifying at the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights and I was able to hear their voices and realize that it comes from the heart and it's the only way that there's going to be any reparation is through making people accountable for what they're doing and we heard that today from the survivor, one of the survivors. Forced and coerced sterilizations are currently considered assault under the criminal code but Boy says she believes the law needs to go one step further and that anyone who uses intimidation, threat, force, or any other form of coercion to get a woman to undergo sterilization be guilty of an indictable offense. Well, there hasn't been any convictions under the assault provisions, and so this will be more of a deterrent, and it specifically deals with sterilization. So sterilization is the focus of this bill, not a general assault or uh, aggravated assault or anything like that. It's just sterilization that will act as a deterrent. The bill has passed two readings in the Senate, and Boye says she's confident it will get government support in Parliament and, and could become law by June. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. A new class action lawsuit is being proposed, which could have significant impacts on the children of residential school survivors. Saskatchewan lawyer Tony Merchant filed a statement of claim in federal court this week. On behalf of Matthew Brandon of Weiwei Sikap Ojibwe Nation in Manitoba, he says courts, Indigenous leaders and media regularly refer to the legacy of residential schools on younger generations of Indigenous peoples. Merchant alleges residential schools made parenting and violence synonymous and has resulted in the ongoing impacts of intergenerational trauma. The claim still needs to be authorized by a judge. The Northwest Company this week asked for the city of Iqaluit, Nunavut, to forgive over $50,000 in water bills due to pipe leakages. In the end, the idea was shot down. The Northwest Company is looking for debt forgiveness from the city of Iqaluit. The company has an estimated net worth of about $1.9 billion. The manager of the local Iqaluit North Mart, Alan Lawry, says water bills that normally cost $1,700 shot up to $56,000 due to leaking pipes on their property. However, in response to the proposal, Iqaluit City Council says much like individual homeowners, the onus is on the building owners to maintain their property and North Mart is no exception. I take a little bit of offense at that. It's not the role of the city to notify you that the maintenance of your equipment is faulty. Um, the, the fact that this leak occurred after the metering um, is... The responsibility for this lies entirely in, in you know, the, the recipient of that water's lap. Uh, there, there's no provision uh, within the city of Akalui to allow for a forgiveness uh, of that payment. To the West Coast now, where the Matsqui First Nation of BC has received a compensation package of $59 million over their land being taken away in 1908 by Canada to build a tramway. AP10's Tina House joins us now to talk more about what this means for the community. Thank you. We're here at the Matsqui First Nation and joining me today is Chief Alice McKay. Chief McKay, can you tell me about the recent settlement from the federal government? 
Yes, it's a uh, right of way for, for the BC Hydro. Um, they trans over, transformed over two of our reserve, and that was about four acres. And this happened in 1908, so it's been a long battle for your community to get a, a compensation package from the federal government. What does it mean for you and your community to finally receive that, that justice and what happened? Well, it, it's actually very amazing. Like, it's, it's, good. it's good for our members. It's good for our relationship with the government because we, we've got a team now with Matsqui. We have four of us that are the core negotiating team. And then we have the government that also has a team. And they actually worked really well with us. And it, it was nice to know that we could have that kind of a relationship going forward. That's amazing. How much land are we talking about here and what does it mean now to actually see that compensation come forward and, and is the land being returned? Well yes, the four acre, it's four acres and now we can use the land and they're going to provide a crossing for us which is very helpful. Um, we were able to use the land a while back but they had they just did a temporary crossing for us so it's good to have the land back and uh, we will find a good use for it, of course. And what do you think it meant for your, your ancestors for not being able to utilize that land that was, was available to them then? Well, it was very, probably very disheartening, disheartening for them to uh, have the government take our land the way they did without giving us any compensation at all. You know, it was probably really hard on them. We had good negotiators in the days, back in the day, so. It was very hard on them. And did they give notice? How did the land get taken? Was it just one day it was there, one day it wasn't? Well, I know in the old days they used to just to use an X for people to sign things. So I'm not sure if they did it before or they did it um, or they just took it. I think they just took it. How many members do you have here on reserve? We have about 150. And do you have plans now and how you'll be furthering development here on your, your land? Yeah, we do. We're going to have a meeting. Um, we were waiting till the settlement came through. And then we have a governing body here. So we are having a strategic meeting in April and we will talk about what we're gonna do with the money. Amazing, and we're talking $59 million was the compensation? Yes, 59 million. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful news. Thank you so much for joining us today. Back to you in studio. Thanks, Tina. A comedy group, the Danger Cats, have been garnering headlines for comedy bits about suspected unmarked graves at former residential schools and selling T-shirts with the face of serial killer Robert Picton on them. Our Truth and Politics panel is here to talk about it all after the break. The Danger Cats comedy troupe aren't laughing these days, or maybe they are. The group that most people had never heard of are now making headlines, even as their shows are being cancelled. Our Truth and Politics panel is here to discuss. Jennifer Lewitz is a policy analyst with the War Shield consulting firm in Saskatchewan, and Negan Sinclair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Jennifer Negan, great to see you this week. Uh, Negan, starting with you, uh, the Danger Cats were selling a t-shirt with Robert Picton's face on it. Family members of his victims and others, of course, were disgusted by that. And it comes, you know, to light at a time when Picton has been eligible to apply for day parole. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you'd only create a marketable or a sellable item like this if you uh, want to profit off the pain and, and trauma of other peoples. Uh, clearly these guys, uh, these individuals have very little respect for the families or the issue at large. And if they had any knowledge whatsoever of the history and um, circumstances, which involve things like stereotypes and representation and uh, treating Indigenous women like they're lesser than, uh, they would understand of the severity of what they've done and particularly how important it is to be sensitive on this issue, uh, considering the circumstances that Picton is looking at uh, 
I don't think he's going to get parole. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there'll be, uh, I mean, cooler heads have got to prevail in this issue and keep him in prison. But at the same time, just making light of this issue in any way is really the most epitome of kind of a privilege of white maleness that is really, really offensive. Uh, Jennifer, at least uh, on the cesspool formerly known as Twitter, it seems that these guys do have quite a bit of uh, support out there. Uh, where do we draw the line between freedom of speech and espousing hate? Um, I think that's a really good question. I think what we're seeing here is, yeah, exactly that word, privilege. Um, I think about the victims of these families, you know, some of them had kids and the last known ties that they have to their family members that went missing is the DNA found on Picton's farms. And now they're being resubjected to potentially going through another trauma, um, in trauma and filled like process because he's eligible to apply for day parole. So how, how do you find humor in that? What part is funny? And to me, it's a matter of creativity. If, if that's where you're going because you can't find creativity in any other areas, then I think that that says a lot. And you got a number of venues, including in Winnipeg and Thunder Bay, had cancelled shows. This was after people were speaking up, contacting venues about uh, concerns, some of their material, making light of suspected unmarked graves as well at residential schools. But it uh, looks like they might even have a sold-out show here in Winnipeg tonight. So, you know, what does this say to you that people are willing to, to shell out for these guys? Uh, at a location, TBA, uh, a, a mysterious location, which tells you about, uh, is this really going to happen? Is, are they just going to spring this a couple hours ahead of time? And I mean, what clearly what they're looking for is controversy creates cash and uh, the kind of ways in which we, by just giving them attention, is are doing exactly what they want, which is to uh, sort of shed light on the most offensive person yelling fire in a crowded theater. And so now all of us are turning our heads and looking towards people who generally have nothing more important to say and nothing of value to say. And this kind of comedy, this kind of humor of shock jock has a long history. It doesn't begin with this issue, but it certainly is one in which it comes and goes. Think back in the days of Andrew Dice Clay, for example, example or all the different people that have said the most offensive misogynistic hating uh, things for particularly women and racial minorities uh, these things come and go over time the key for us is to try to find a balance in not giving it gasoline or attention um, at the same time calling it out when it needs to be called out and, and to help our relatives who think that this is funny or to think that they've been conditioned to think that it's funny to help them understand that this is not uh, the kind of uh, civil discourse that we need in our society Jennifer, kind of on that point, you know, the Danger Cats are saying they shut down their shows themselves for safety reasons, uh, concerns for the venues, that they're giving money from the Picton shirts to Ukraine. I'd be willing to guess most people have never heard of them before this controversy. Are they successfully trolling everyone here, including the media, and having the last laugh? Uh, they might be. Um, I'm one of the people that had never heard of them before this. I actually had to ask my husband if he had actually heard of them and went to the YouTube and didn't see a whole lot of views or anything like that. So I think they had been popular at one point. And now what we're seeing is almost exactly that shock value coming back, maybe to increase that popularity or to become relevant again, if they ever were. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with not spending too much energy on fueling the fire with these people but i also think calling it out is important and making sure that people like this understand that it's it's harmful and you know i'm sure everyone can point to someone that they've dealt with in their life before that you know turns the argument around on you like oh of course you're offended or of course you think it's too far it's like yeah i do i i think if there's if there's victims involved that have to relive trauma and you're trying to profit off of that i'm not i don't think that that's okay Jennifer Negan, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate you spending your time with us this week. Great. You watch. Thanks. Hi. A number of Mi'kmaq communities are taking a new approach to community safety that's using traditional ways to de-escalate situations. That story plus a preview of tonight's Nation to Nation after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Linda shared this photo of a beautiful sunset she captured on the Nelson River ice crossing near Norway House in northern Manitoba. Thanks for sharing, Linda. You can send your pictures to share at aptn.ca. 
for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now time to take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, minus 6 with snow in Halifax, 4 below in Fredericton, minus 20 with snow in Kujuac, cloudy and 18 below in Nain. 2 above in Montreal, minus 1 for Val d'Or, plus 5 in Sault Ste. Marie, rain and uh, 5 in North Bay. Sun's out and 6 for Thunder Bay, plus 3 in Sioux Lookout. Minus 8 with snow in God's Lake, 7 below and flurries for Norway House. 3 above in Winnipeg, plus 1 for Dauphin. Minus 5 in Regina, snow and 11 below in Saskatoon. Minus 12 for Meadow Lake, 13 below with snow in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, minus 20 for High Level and Fort Chippewa. Minus 13 with snow in Edmonton, 1 below in Lethbridge. Plus 7 in Vancouver, snow and 6 above in Kamloops. Minus 4 for Prince George, flurries and 3 below in Smithers. Minus 29 in Old Crow, 18 below with snow in Whitehorse. Minus 19 with snow in Yellowknife, 24 below in Norman Wells. Minus 29 in Saks Harbor, 28 below in Polituck and Colville Lake. Minus 28 in Chesterfield, 30 below for Baker Lake. Minus 31 in Resolute, 34 below in Joe Haven. A new peacekeeping program has been launched in seven Mi'kmaq communities. Its goal is to create safer communities, but do so by turning its back on conventional policing methods. Angel Moore reports. I think an important issue for us too is making sure that our, our people and our, and our children know that they could turn to us for anything. That's T.C. Ward. He's patrolling his community of Metabanagiog. He's doing it in his new position as a peacekeeper, a Mi'kmaq-led alternative to enforcement-based policing. And that, you know, that could, that could vary from not just like a police matter. It could be somebody lost or, you know, somebody who, who needs somebody to talk to. You know, and I'm, I'm glad to be that shoulder. I'm, you know, I'm, that's who I am. Ward is one of 14 people who graduated from a seven-week training program held at New Brunswick Community College in Miramichi. Mi'kma'wel Dabludahan, a Mi'kmaq advocacy group, developed the Peacekeepers program. It's guided by Mi'kmaq laws in de-escalation and conflict management. Two peacekeepers serve each of the seven Mi'kmaq communities in the province. Hopefully, hopefully I get called before 911 you know, and I can de-escalate de the situation. And in terms of crime, in the sense of whenever the RCMP are needed, hopefully I'll be there before them. Wanda Ward took part in the community engagement sessions when the program rolled out last December. This program is awesome for the community. And like I said, we don't have to redevelop our customs and send somebody to sensitivity training about Mi'kmaq issues and cultural issues. We have them already because of those two individuals were come from the Indigenous community. Bill Ward is chief of the Metapanagyog Mi'kmaq Nation. He says people have lost trust in police, especially after the shooting deaths of Rodney Levi and Chantel Moore in June 2020. It was a lot of learning, it was a lot of healing, it was a lot of pain, especially for the family, um, a lot of trust um, and distrust of the RCMP, and it's still, we're, we're still working on trying to mend that relationship. It's definitely going to take some time, but I think this Peace Breaker program is going to um, really assist in doing that. Moore was fatally shot by Edmonston police during a wellness check. Days later, Levi was shot and killed by RCMP after police were called to a disturbance at a home in Sunny Corner, one kilometer from Metapanagiog. Rodney's sister, Rhoda Levi, praises the peacekeeping program. And I think this peacekeeper course is going to really change how we interact like, with the law because we don't, that justice system now is not meant for us wasn't meant for us and was not made for us. She hopes it will prevent further tragedy. I really, really do believe this is gonna really improve the safety of our people. That way it doesn't, whatever, what happened to my brother Rodney doesn't happen to anybody else. 
In the meantime, T.C. Ward patrols his community that is still impacted by the shooting death of Rodney Levi. I can tell you with my with my heart and behind it, everything behind it, that you know we're going to do our best to prevent something like that happening again. There are plans in place to continue training new recruits who may be ready to patrol in the spring. However, the program still requires sustainable funding. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Metapanagiog, Mi'kmaq Nation. Just a few minutes from now is the leap year edition of Nation to Nation. They don't happen often. Annette Francis is in our Ottawa studio with a preview. Stick around for Nation to Nation. We'll hear from NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. He's pushing for the reform of the Nutrition North program after the joint APTN and CBC investigation looked at the rising cost of food in northern communities. As well, forever chemicals are contaminating our water, soils, air and food. We'll hear what this means and why Indigenous health experts and environmentalists are calling for a ban. We'll have that and more coming up after the news. False claims of Indigenous identity have made headlines across the country in recent years. Coming up tomorrow night on APTN Investigates, video journalist Rob Smith continues his investigation into allegations of so-called pretendianism within the Algonquins of Ontario. Here's a preview of Return to Algonquin Country. Last season, we brought you the story about the Troubles in Algonquin Territory. Because there seems to be some sort of action, there's some more engaged youth definitely from Pickwaknagon. I have a difficult time understanding who would have lived their entire life say, you know what, I'm going to be Algonquin. I'm envious of them, or perhaps I just want to sabotage them. In 200 meters, you will arrive at your destination. Well, a lot of the people who were enrolling in these process were not Algonquin. One lone ancestor 12 generations back is entirely insufficient. So I'm back in Algonquin territory, traveling the highways and byways with two questions on my mind. What is the future of this claim? And will the AOO survive? I'd like us to be recognized as who we are. It has nothing to do with money, it has nothing to do with the land claim. It has to do with who we are and what we are. Looking forward to Rob's update. You can catch APTN Investigates Return to Algonquin Country tomorrow night, right here following the APTN National News. We'll also hear from Rob Smith about his continued look into this issue tomorrow night here on the news. Uh, just a quick note to pass along now that the family of Brian Mulroney, the 18th Prime Minister of Canada, saying that he has passed away at the age of 84. Certainly be hearing a lot more about that in the coming days. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News this Thursday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Stick around for Nation to Nation. Have a good night.